Hello. All right. This video is getting us into Sparta. However, before we can do that, oh, I guess I should make it big, right? How's that? We need to talk about this word right here. Polis. Polis. It's one of your vocab words. Um, the word polis is just another word for a city state. That's it. It's just a city state. So a city that basically is all by itself. Greece at this point is not unified in any way, shape, or form. There is not a Greek king. You have every single city has its own leadership. Maybe a king, maybe not. Every single city has its own form of government, has its own laws, has its own everything. They're all separate. Pretty much the only time they ever come together is if they're coming together to fight a war or if they're coming together for basic trade. Okay. But for the most part, these cities, they're separate from each other. That's a city state. But the word is polis. You've heard this when you've heard like metropolis, Indianapolis, whenever you see the word polis on the end. Okay. The plural is weird. And this is going to matter for, <coughs> for whenever you have to write like little short answers um, on your tests and stuff coming up. The plural is weird. P-O-L-E-I-S. You just stick an E in there. And it sounds weird. The word is poleis. It's not polises. Sparta and Athens are polises. No, 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 no. Sparta and Athens are poleis. It doesn't feel plural. I know but it is. So just be aware whenever you write, the plural is poleus and that will come up. Otherwise I wouldn't be telling you, I would let it go. Um, but you stick an E in there and it's plural. Okay. Okay. This right here, y'all, I will go through this quickly, hopefully because it's not exciting. I know we do need to talk about these types of governments because again, every single different polis Sorry, I just got a text. Um, every single different polis has a different kind of government. The one that most of them are, you should already be familiar with, monarchy. Uh, we talked about this all last year in AP World. Hereditary king. One man rules, hereditary. You could have a constitutional monarchy where you have a parliament and a king, or you could have an absolute monarchy where the king is all by himself. It doesn't matter, but it's still a monarchy, okay? You have one person and it's hereditary rule. Oligarchy. We didn't really talk about oligarchy last year. Um, an oligarchy is where you have a small group of nobles, small group. So think parliament, but no king. That would be like an oligarchy. Um, you just have a group of men who come together and make a decision. Now, it's not a democracy. In a democracy, people vote for who they want to be in charge. This is where you just have a group of nobles get together and say, hey, we're in charge. We're calling the rules. We're calling the rules. We're calling the shots. They just all get together and do their thing, okay? Sparta is weird. Sparta is going to be a monarchic oligarchy. You're like, what? It's where you have two kings, but you also have an oligarchy. Nobles come together. Okay. So then let me move my big old head. You have a tyranny. Uh, we did talk about this a little bit last year when we talked about um, Napoleon Bonaparte and we talked about um, Adolf Hitler. In a tyranny, you have somebody who starts out looking like they're doing well. Things look good at first. They make you promises that, oh my gosh, are you ready for this? They're actually going to keep at first. 
Um, they pro like Hitler promised to fix the economy of of what's it called of Germany. Did he? Yeah, by destroying other people. Napoleon, he ended the French Revolution and brings France some stability. Great. And then he turns around and goes to war. So that's what happens is they start out looking good and actually doing what they promise. But then their devil horns come out. The devil horns come out and it gets bad. That's a tyrant. Um, with Hitler, you know, it was always planned because of Mein Kampf. With Napoleon, we don't know. Maybe power just went to his head and he decides to take over all of Europe. Who knows? Okay. But you start out doing well. You start out with support of the people. You start out um, actually doing what you promise. And then you turn on people. That's a tyrant. And then we have the two that people get mixed up all the time. Democracy and republic. In a democracy, in theory... All people, what? All people get to vote. We talked about this last year when we did the enlightenment. We call ourselves a democracy all the time. We are not. There's three groups of people here in America that don't get to vote. You, my sweet little angels. Yeah, anybody under 18, sorry about you. Now, will you get to vote later? Yes, of course. Um, another group of people that can't vote, felons, they have lost their right to vote. You take someone's rights. John Locke said, we take yours away. So you no longer have the right to vote. And then the third group, non-citizens. It's another group that can vote as soon as they get their citizenship. In a democracy, the idea is that all people that's not really possible, though. Um, so because of that, most countries who claim democracy, they're actually republics. What that means is that most people get to vote. Um, uh, not Greece, Athens. Athens is going to claim democracy, and they are darn proud of it. But they're not. Like, they're they're not even really a republic, but they're not. Only a small group of people really get to vote, okay? They come up with the idea of democracy, the, the theory of democracy. Um, but just know democracy it doesn't really work. It's kind of like communism. It's not really possible. You really just have extreme socialism that we call communism. Or you really have a republic that we call democracy, Okay. Okay, so this is the boring government stuff. Let's go to Sparta. You've all heard of Sparta, okay? Um, it's the military city-state. There's several city-states, oops, in Greece. I mean, there's several. Like, you see several just on this map right here, okay? Thebes, Ath Athens, that's what just came out of my, my mouth. Thebes, Athens, Delphi, Corinth. You see all of these. We already talked about Troy, but the two big ones are Athens, right here, and Sparta, right here. Both of them are incredibly powerful, like in their own right. But I think part of what makes them so famous, too, like to talk about on a regular basis, is because they're, like, they're opposites, sort of. Like, they're not really, but they are. And you'll see what I mean. But they're opposites, sort of. So... Sparta. That's where we're starting down here. Okay. Um, and Sparta, if you remember, the patron god of Sparta is Ares, the god of war. Sparta is a military polis. Kind of like the militarism of Germany, like we talked about last year. They're focused on war. They want to be the strongest. And they're going around taking over other, like, weaker people groups in the area, other weaker city-states. And typically what they'll do is they'll take – we talked about this last year, but I only, I only glossed over it. They'll take people and then sell them into slavery. Greek-on-Greek Greek slavery. 
typically they're going to sell them to Athens, but we'll get to that. Okay, so Sparta is like big on military. They had this issue one time where a whole bunch of people, like a whole bunch of their servants and stuff, like revolted. And they came down hard on them. So it makes Sparta this like real militant, or it makes Sparta have like this real militant mindset, okay? Where they're like, we don't ever want anybody to like take us over ever again. So we're going we're gonna to be harsh with people. I don't know why there's all these kids in the hall. It's like school's out. What is today? May 31st? I don't know, whatever. Okay, so these are some of the ruins of Sparta today. There is like a modern, modern town Sparta, but there are still some ruins of the ancient city Sparta, um, like going down the mountain. Do you see where you see these arches right here? You see more arches right here? That's not ancient Spartan. That's actually once the Romans came in. The Romans are the ones who do those arches. So see, like in this picture here, you can see the arches here. Those arches only come after Rome has come in and conquered them. Okay. So if you want to get timeline again, let's see. What we're talking about right now is in this like 1100. I don't know what that text means. I'm sure Ms. Clark says hi again though. That's her. So anyway, it's from this like 1100 time period to about 323. So all in here is kind of what I'm talking about now. And then uh, Rome comes in here. So again, just understand wherever you see arches, Okay, like this, you're looking at Roman stuff. So the Romans may have completely built over it or they may have just like added arches in, who knows. But this is part of what the ancient city of Sparta is, like down the mountain. Sparta was typically, <laughs> I can't change it. Ugh. You guys. Okay, Sparta was typically <laughs> in the middle this little valley here, you see a little bit of a rise over here. You see a rise over here. And Sparta's here in the middle of this valley. So what you're seeing in those pictures is going up the mountain. But yeah, basically this is Sparta. Based on um, what's it called? Archaeological findings. And what people said about it. Does it remind you of Gnosis a little bit? The Minoan city of Gnosis. Hmm. Hmm. It should. Okay. <laughs> Again, the Spartans. <clears throat> um, the Spartans <clears throat> are a military city-state. You guys, I forgot to set the timer. <sighs> okay. I'll try to keep up. Um, anyway, the Spartans are a military city-state. Again, everything is focused on power and warfare, wanting to be the strongest in the whole area. And if you look at what their soldiers basically look like, does it kind of remind you a little bit of maybe Ares? I mean, I understand he's not naked, but it looks like the god Ares. I think I have another picture. Oh, I don't. Well, just kidding. We'll come back to it in a minute. But anyway, it does kind of resemble the god Ares here. Okay. That being said. The story about the Spartan men is that at the age of seven, they were sent off to a military school that was a few miles away. Um, it's not actually in the city of Sparta. Okay, it's a little bit far away um, because they wanted these boys to not have, what's the word, like the, I don't know, the luxuries of home. Um, they also don't want these boys to have the distractions of home or the coddling of mommy, or the distractions of girls, or whatever. So they take these boys totally out um, of the, 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 the city and to these military barracks where they start teaching them stuff. It's military school, all right? Seven. 
Yo, that's like second grade. That's a baby. It's crazy to me to think seven years old. But I mean, again, you know, on average, like 15 is an adult, historically speaking. You know, girls are being married off as soon as they have their period. So pff, things were a little different back then. But still, seven years old, they're going to this military school. And basically, they're in the military until they're 30. When they're 30, if they choose to stay in, awesome. You absolutely can stay in, of course. However, if you want to leave at the age of 30, you go back to the city of Sparta. Now, based on your social status, you do whatever. If you want to be out of the military at the age of 30 and you are a, I don't know, middle class artisan, then you go back to your shop and you make, I don't know, shoes or whatever it is you made, pottery or whatever that your family made. Um, if you're a noble guy who wants out of the military, for the most part, you're probably going to choose to be part of the government. And again, I'll talk about that in a minute, but you're probably going to join the government, the oligarchy, um, the council is what it was called, the council of elders. But anyway, um, you're for sure going to find yourself a wife. You're 30. She's very young. Again, y'all, as soon as girls had their periods and they can get pregnant, they are of marrying age. So if the girl that you find is 18, 19, okay. Although that's not normally the case. Like you're an old maid back then if you're not married, but whatever. Um, if she's 15, okay. If she's 12, okay. Um, so yeah, the women are much younger than the men in ancient Sparta. Um, think about what's the word, the population, the demographics of Sparta. Since every male from the age of seven to 30 is gone, the only boys that are left in the town are younger than seven or older than 30. Now y'all, I'm 45. 30 is not old. Even back then, okay, 30 wasn't old but it was an elder. They're not old and gray yet, okay? But they are considered the older population. So it's kind of weird. Because of that, any women, okay, they were expected to, like they were, they were basically educated, basic education. I don't mean like hardcore education. That's Athens. Basic education. Women had to be able to like run the businesses. So that's basic math. Basic math, you guys. They're not like, like educating women. It's, it's not that, it's not that good. Um, the women in, in Sparta are athletic um, they're taught how to defend themselves, not in a fighting stance. They're taught how to defend themselves if they must. Like, like they, don't, they don't hang out with weapons and stuff. They don't go to war, okay? But they are taught basic survival because, again, all the men in the military are away at the barracks. The only men who are there are, again, o over 30 who left the military were younger than seven. So if the city gets attacked, the women have to be able to like, like hold their own and take care of the city until the military gets there. All right. So I think I skipped that. Yeah, this is the women's stuff. Sorry, right here. We'll go back to the phalanx in a minute. Um, but anyway, so this is all the women thing. As far as the government goes, since I'm already there, I did go out of order, but that's okay. This is an oligarchic government, but it's weird because it also, they also have kings. So it's like a monarchic oligarchy or a, it's weird. You have two hereditary kings, two. Could that be a problem? What if one king wants to do something and the other king doesn't? Yeah, I mean, that's a problem. 
these kings, think of them a little bit more like generals, I guess. They're in charge of the military. Now, they have a lot of say in the government, of course, but they're in charge of the military. It is hereditary, though, which in my head is weird. What if you end up with a military leader like a general who sucks, but he still gets to be the general because he's, it's hereditary. It's just, it's strange, but they're also training these boys starting at age seven. So I, I bet that didn't happen on a regular basis. But these two kings, they each control their own set of men. So in theory, one man could choose to go off and fight a war when another man doesn't. And that's the story of something very famous. We'll get there in a minute. But that in theory could happen where the entire army of Sparta doesn't go to fight but only half because one king says we're going and the other king says we're not. So it's kind of weird. Then you have the oligarchy which is the council of elders. And again, even though the word elder is being used, it's not like old person. These men are 30. Again, point of reference, I'm 45. I know to some of you guys, I'm so ancient, but I can still do stuff. Like I'm not elderly. So it's just kind of weird. It's called the Council of Elders. They're this big group of nobles who want to be in the council and they get called to discuss situations, to come up with, um, what's it called? Like, I can't think of the word, like ways to fix issues. Um, they will vote to decide things. They'll vote to pass laws. But it's weird because it's not a democracy where you, the people, vote for them. They're just nobles and they just join if they want to. It's a little different. It's a little different. It's a little weird. But I mean, I guess it works for Sparta because this government form works for a while. So I don't know. It's very strange. Um, okay, let me go back to this right here. One of the big, like, famous ways that the Spartans fought. This is a big deal because Alexander the Great is going to copy this form of fighting. Rome copies this form of fighting. Y'all, I mean, the Vikings almost do. I mean, they call it shield walls, but it's the same basic idea. It's called a phalanx. Phalanx. Uh, I believe this is a vocab word. A phalanx is where you're putting all of your shields together and you're using these shield formations to help fight. The shield isn't just a defensive thing in a phalanx. The shield can be used to push forward. The shield can be used like I love the... Ah! Stupid microphone. I hate these things. Um, look at this one. This is my favorite form of phalanx. It's the turtle shell. Look at that. Isn't that cute. Okay, but for real, like the phalanx, basically the idea is this the Spartan shields are huge. They don't just cover like, like you. They're huge. Like they go from like here to like mid thigh. They're huge. And the way that you hold it, if you if you notice in this picture, I don't know if you can actually tell in this picture, but everybody's holding their spears with the same hands. That's how they're taught to do it. What if you're left-handed? This is how you're taught to do it. You hold your spear, okay, in the right hand, and you hold your shield in the left hand, or vice versa, whatever, but everybody does the same thing. Because the way that the shield works, and I can actually show you in class like while I'm standing there, but I can't do it here because it's not far enough back. But the way the shield works, you hold it off to the side a little bit, okay? Here. You 
you hold it off to the side a little bit so that this side of the shield is covering you. This side of the shield is covering the person next to you. This part of my body over here is shielded by the person next to me. We are all so tight and our shields are so tight together that we're all protecting each other. And this line right here, when they're told to move forward, the entire line moves forward together at the same time. Again, the Vikings use this exact same idea. They just don't call it a phalanx, shield wall. The Romans use this exact same idea. It actually works kind of well. And you have this protection from the shields, and then everybody will take the spear at the same time and be like, they all jab at the same time. So it's like this machine moving at the same time. I mean, it works fairly well. Now, once gunpowder and crap comes onto the scene, you know that's not going to, like, that's up. That's gone. But until we have gunpowder and stuff, the phalanx works really well. And again, like I already showed you a little bit, look at the turtle shell phalanx. It's so cute. Uh, we actually don't know if it was really, truly ever used, but it sure is cute. You just, can you imagine like a whole turtle shell walking at the same time? And like every now and then spears being like, Pachoo! out of the little holes. I just think it's so cute. I want to believe that they actually used it. We just don't know if they actually did um, or if it was just like in writing. I don't know, but I think it's fun. That leads us to this huge series of wars that are fought between Greece and the Persians. Okay. Whenever I used to teach, um, like ancient world, my kids already knew the Persians. <laughs> Y'all don't know them at all. Okay. Look, this map right here, this is Greece right here. So if I zoom back out, you can get like an idea of how little Greece is. This is Greece right here, okay? Um, the city of Troy that we talked about would have been like right here. The warrior people, the Hittites, were in this area here. And then you have Mesopotamia. And look at all this. It's one big empire now, isn't it? It's Persia. The Persians took over everything that you see in color on this map. Okay? Everything you see in color here. Up to this point in history, the Persian Empire was the biggest. Now, I know you've already learned the Mongolians are the biggest. Y'all, this is way before that. Way before that. Okay? We're not even close to that. So, way before that. We're still in BC time. The Mongolians are 1200 80. Okie dokie. So that being said, um, the Persians start out when a king named Cyrus, well, really, I mean, they exist before that, but like the empire, a king named Cyrus comes in and takes over all of this, like light color. Okay. Then you have Cambyses, who was just. Bleh. He was not a good king. But Cambyses comes in and takes this. Okay. And then you have a king who's so important, but oh my gosh, everybody says his name wrong. It's Darius. Here's his name right here. And I know everybody wants to say Darius. Is this nicht correct? Darius. Okay. So King Darius. King Darius comes in. And he goes farther this way into India than anybody has before. He comes up here, over here, and up here. But look what Darius hasn't been able to take. Whoopsie. Darius wanted to take over Greece, and that did not happen. Okay, here we go. 
So you have your map, okay? And this right here, you see this interchange, this exact um, relief right here, this stone relief. Sometimes you'll see it showing, um, what's it called? King Cyrus. Sometimes you'll see it showing King Darius. I don't know. I don't know. But basically, that's what they look like, the Persians. You see these long beards. There we go. You see these long beards. You see the curly hair. Okay. So Darius wants to take over Greece. I mean, he's, he's added so much land to um, the Persian Empire already. He wants to take Greece. Greece is already a very, like, well-known, like, well-established place. And they're all separate poleis. Remember that word? They're all separate. So really, it should be very easy to take a whole bunch of separate people. They're not a united people. I told y'all. Like, that was one of the big reasons uh, Germany wanted to unite. All of those tiny little Germanic kingdoms can get taken over in a heartbeat. Napoleon showed us that. Darius looks at Greece and says, look at all these individual cities. So easy. Well, he dies. Oops. He dies. Xerxes. And that's this name right here. I wrote his son. Is Xerxes his son? Hmm. I would have said nephew, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Whatever. They're related, okay? Or grandson. I don't know. I wrote his son, but I'm not 100% sure. It might be grandson or I don't know. They're related. Just go with it. Xerxes, okay? And I know you're like, Z Xerxes. When Darius dies, Xerxes makes this like vow, I will take Greece. Okay, so it's a big thing. And the Persian Wars kind of happen in like two different, I don't know, phases. You have the phase where Darius is trying to take the Greeks and then he goes away because he dies. Uh, so anyway, the Persians go away because Darius dies, but then they come back under Xerxes. Okay. This is what you've all heard of. This is what the movie 300 depicted. Um, and let me, let me hit that for a second. If you've seen the movie 300, what you're seeing in there is an exaggerated story. You're seeing a true story told the way the Greeks would have told a story. Like with the Iliad, where Homer's going to, what's the word, embellish certain things. Um, the Persian military, the immortals, they're this, I can't think of the word, almost not earthly group who's coming all together to fight. Y'all, they're just people. They're just people. But it's all exaggerated the way that the Greeks would have exaggerated a story. Okay? So just be aware of that. Um, so anyway, the Persians under Xerxes are coming in to take over. Okay? And you have Xerxes, and he's on the left oopsie he's on the left over here in this relief what you're seeing in this relief of xerxes is xerxes here and then there's two servants basically um holding an umbrella over his head um not for rain it's probably sun and then on this side over here you have king leonidas of sparta right here King Leonidas was one of the two kings of Sparta. And I think I'm going to have to pause this because I have an interview that I have to do. Hold on just a second. There should be a pause, but I don't know where it is. We might have to do this in two separate. I swear there's usually a pause. Okay, well, I'll just try and go fast. Okay, so anyway, um, King Leonidas is one of the two kings of Sparta. And 
and he knows that Xerxes is coming. Okay. So he wants to take the military and push Xerxes back. Well, the other king does not want to do that. So this is one of those situations where having the two kings both like in charge of half of the military, kind of a problem. Yeah. Leonidas is going to take his men and y'all, it's not 300 of them, but just go with it again. It just sounds good. Um, but anyway, he takes his men and then the other king is going to stay in Sparta. <laughs> yeah, look right here. It's actually around 7,000 men. I don't know. Um, it's the 300 is said because there were 300 Spartans, but then there's other people that show up um, to push the Persians out. Even non-Greeks, there are some people there who aren't even Greek, but that's okay, whatever. So what you need to notice though is look at the difference in Xerxes' army. Now, this being the first thing that we've talked about, the first like war in AP Euro, you all are coming out of AP World, where we saw numbers in World War II like, like, you know, 3.5 million Allied troops, 6 million Russians. The numbers are way bigger. This is just 300,000. But you've got to remember, too, like this is ancient history. So it's a little bit different. Okay. Here's, here's the thing, though. Leonidas knew that he wouldn't win. He knew. He knew he wouldn't beat them. The numbers are too big, and I need to move my little face, so if you need to pause it to get the rest of this, pause it. What he's hoping to do is kind of hold off the Persians long enough that other Greek city-states can get together and, um, oops, can get together and join him. There we go. Okay, um, that's one version. There are some versions that say nobody ever planned on fighting the Persians. I found that hard to believe, though, that the Greeks wouldn't, wouldn't fight. I guess when you're looking back, the Persian Empire is so big that maybe the Greeks were like, oh, there's just no point. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. But we do have two different versions. Again, one where Leonidas is, he knows that everybody's coming. He's just hoping to hold off the Persians long enough for the whole Greek military to get together. And again, other versions say, nah, they weren't coming. And he knew it. And it was like a suicide mission. We don't know. Okay, but you will hear both of those stories. So basically, here's the plan. And I'll show you on the map in a minute. You know what? Oh, I have a typo. Look. Oh. Sorry, guys. Minus one point. Uh, if you need to pause it, pause it because I'm going to move on. Look at this map right here. The way that the Persians were coming. There we go. The way that the Persians were coming, okay, so they're down here, is, and then you see Xerxes up here. This red is Xerxes, uh, the blue, that's not blue, the green is um, Darius. So Xerxes is coming this way, okay? Sparta, here, move my head up here, there we go. Sparta's right here. Leonidas is Spartan, okie dokie. That being said, okay, so look, I gotta get my hand around this, this microphone. Okay, so look, they're coming this way, all right? Leonidas takes his men up this way because it's really hard to see, but right here, when you look at it up close, number two, right here, when you look at it up close, it looks like this. It's this little tiny stretch of land that is walkable. You have water right here, and then you have mountains, cliffs, all up here. 
The only place that's walkable is here, this light color. So Leonidas knows this, okay? And he's like, look, if we can stop them at the thinnest part right here and just fight and fight and fight and fight, maybe we can hold them off long enough again for everybody to come. It's a great idea. But we're looking at 300,000-ish versus 7,000 tops. Only around 300 trained Spartans. And that's not even true either. I don't remember the exact number, but it wasn't, it wasn't 300. It's around there somewhere. But this is going to be rough. But again, they're hoping that they can funnel them in. Okay. Basically what happens is there is a traitor in the midst. Oh, oh, oh. there's a traitor. Let me move my big old head. Okay, because for a while, Xerxes is doing this, and this plan's working beautifully. Until there's this guy who says, hey, there's this mountain pass. If we go backwards, we can attack them from behind. Dirty rat. This guy leads them this way, and the story is it was it was a Greek guy that did it. I mean, he almost has to be to know this path, right? But anyway, he leads them this way, and basically um, the Leonidas' men, the, the 300 men, are in case they're surrounded. Okay, let me do this. So you can get the top up here. That's what I was just talking about. Okay. Um, one guy left, supposedly, to tell everybody what was happening. Y'all, other people left. Other people were, like, sent back. But one guy for sure was sent to Sparta to tell everybody what happened. Um, you know, I don't think I told you. The name of this battle, I'm so sorry. It's weird. Thur Ma Pali. Thermopylae. Thermopylae. Uh, sorry, I don't think I told you that. So anyway, um, this one guy is like sent back to Sparta to tell them what happened. They know now like they're surrounded. They're all going to die. They do die. Um, after the story like gets out, suddenly all the Greeks come together and they fight together. Uh, again, we don't know if they came together because of the story because the 300 stood strong against the Persians, or if they always planned it and they just were trying to get their stuff together. I mean, again, when we talked World War I and II, you remember both times England says, let's go to war, but they're not really ready. It takes some time to get militarized and ready to go where you need to be. So it could have been that the Greeks were always planning on going Leonidas was just leading the way and like keeping the Persians back. Or it could be that, yeah, the story is that they, they hear about, you know, the bravery of the 300 and as a result, then they go. We don't know. Regardless, a large group of Greek city states like all get together. They all get together and they just phew, nail the Persians and they nail them good. In fact, Xerxes goes home. It's bad. It's a bad loss. By the way, I was going to go fast through it, but I want you to look. Do you see this? This is not a fast thing. Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, the Persian Wars last a while. But um, Xerxes goes home. He's like, ugh, these Greeks. And then he gets killed by one of his own men. One of his own military men. One of his own bodyguards. What? <laughs> I know. But with the death of Xerxes, basically, kind of sort of the end of the Persian Wars. Sparta, they're a beast, man. And they'll have many more wars. But that...
is where we are stopping. Tomorrow, Athens. Bye.